Shalom, shalom. You know, it, it's always a privilege to, to come up here and to share the word of God with you. You know, every week I learn more things, but I want to tell you something. Every week I feel I, I don't know enough, right? This is the depth of the word of God. So let, let us turn our, our, uh, our Bibles to the second epistle to the Thessalonians where the Apostle Paul is about to give some important information about the latter times, our times today. In there he writes about the man of lawlessness, the, the son of perdition. This is how he calls the Antichrist. He will tell us how he enters the world scene and what he will do. This text follows the one of Daniel and also the words of Yeshua in the Gospels and that of John in Revelation 11. All these writings tell us that we, what we need to know about this man who will personify rebellion against God and will lead the world into the final wars. Paul also had one important teaching of the end times. He will also tell us about the church in the end times. He, he follows the teaching of Yeshua and Revelation in the, in the gospel as well and teaches that the church is heading towards an apostasy. While well, it already began right at its birth, the complete apostasy will take effect after the rapture when the church will be composed of only non-believers because the believers won't be there. Both these things, the Antichrist and the apostasy, and as it is with the political aspect of, of the end times, we can already see rising in the, in the horizon. Why then Paul teaching these things? You know, in the previous letters, he, he spoke about the rapture itself, which is one of the most extraordinary teaching that we have in the scriptures. He told us that the Lord himself will descend from heaven. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord for eternity and eternity. Amen? Amen. This is how the last generation of believers on earth will meet the Lord and their loved ones who are now in, he in heaven. You know, the rapture marks the moment of the resurrection of their bodies. Of those, especially, of course, of those who had died, that is, in the Messiah. For those alive at that time, it would be a metamorphosis. Then we will be changed into a new body, fit for our eternal abode. This is what Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 15. Furthermore, in the first letter, Paul answered the believers in Thessalonica who wanted to know about the often asked question. When would the coming of the Lord be and how to prepare for it? This is when Paul always, inspired by the Holy Spirit, told them that concerning the times and seasons, they do not need to know. For there is no precondition to the rapture. It will come imminently at any time. As for the preparation, we've seen. He told them, work out your sanctification. For who? Because we're going to meet the Lord. Be prepared to meet the Lord. Two things are then taught in this first letter, the rapture and its imminency. However, about a year later, there were some new developments in the congregation. While their faith and their strong love grew tremendously, and while they also experienced much persecution and affliction, at the same time, they were bombarded with all kinds of new literature and new teaching. What they were taught is that they were, because they were suffering, that the day of the Lord happened. They thought, actually, that they were in the tribulation time. All of this brought much confusion in the congregation. Paul told them that the rapture would be the next prophecy, yet everything around them, even the political scene, pointed to the tribulation time. So they wrote Paul, and Paul answers. His answer makes the second letter a very important document for the end times and is very much for us today. This letter will answer many questions. We hear, we often hear. For instance, are the believers going to go through the tribulation, as many believe? Or perhaps will the believers grow for only to the first three and a half years of the tribulation, as many teach? Paul's answers, I want to tell you, are clear. The believer will not at all enter the tribulation, which is a time of judgment, for we have been judged on the cross, on the tab already. The next prophecy to occur is the rapture with nothing else preceding it. And this is what is Paul's argument, I believe, in the whole of the second letter. However, remember that Paul's writings are among the most 
sometimes complicated, right? This is what Peter told us. And also of the most interesting ones to study. And so it is my prayer that the Ruach HaKodesh will guide us today in our reading of these wonderful records which we have, which are also fully inspired by God. Now let us look into this letter. It is in the first verses that we find out that something happened in between the two letters which brought Paul's passion and love to be poured out on these new believers who dis despite great opposition, they actually they groan. They groan so much. See how Paul speaks of their growth. Let's start with verse 3. He says, we are bound to thank God always for you, brothers, for it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you shall abound towards each other right you know they follow Paul's teaching in the previous letter and they worked at their sanctification and it showed in their faith and in their love their faith which is the first letter of Paul you know that he actually prayed for that in 1 Thessalonians 3.10 and see how Paul describes this faith here he describes its growth. Paul says that it was greatly enlarged. This is one word in the Greek, and it is a rare word. Hyper or hyper oxano. Okay, from oxano, which already means to grow to the extreme limits, preceded by the word hyper, means above and beyond. This word is only found here in the New Testament, and it's only found three times in classical Greek. And when used, it means to attain great power, to achieve the highest position. Paul loves, by the way, to fetch out these words in order to express his feeling, and to, to be, he was so impressed by their growth. As for love, which is in the first letter, Paul, he prayed for it in 1 Thess 3.12. And now it has grown. It has grown. It says the Greek is used to also say too much, right? As if it was so high, right? But this growth, I want to tell you, came at a cost. Verse 4 revealed to us what they were going through. See what verse 4 tells us. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God, for your patience and faith in all your, here we are, persecution and tribulations that you endure. This is what these new believers then at around 50 AD began to endure, persecution and tribulation. It was obvious that the church of God as their savior was going to be persecuted right, and not be welcomed in this world. But Paul, who had a shepherd's heart, was so taken by their suffering that from verse 5 to verse 10, he reminds us of the, like, like the two sons of Zebedee. Remember when they asked God to throw fire into those who refused Yeshua. As he was writing from Corinth and unable to, to do anything from there, really, he longed for the coming of the Lord to settle that matter. He spoke so much of the coming of the Lord. In verse 8, for instance. He says he will come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in the next verse, he spoke of hell. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Do you see how much he loved them? How he longed for his protection. He couldn't do anything. So he calls on God. He will recognize the nursing mother. Right? whom Paul compared himself to in the first letter. A nursing mother is one who cherishes and feeds her own children, for these were new believers, and he saw that there were so many who would come to persecute them and to teach them the wrong things. Here also we recognize the father who, whom Paul was and, and to whom he also compared himself to in the first letter, because he exhorted them, he comforted them, and implored. He says, I do this as a father. It's so interesting, by the way, that, that the Holy Spirit allowed this strong emotion to be penned down in the scripture. And we ask the question, why would the Holy Spirit allow Paul's display of emotions here? Surely, I want to tell you, because these are his feelings as well. I truly believe these are his feelings as well. As it, is, as it was with the prophets in the Hebrew scriptures. It is not always clear if the feelings, you know, are from them or from God when you read about what they're saying. 
And it's beautiful to see the, the strong partnership between the shepherds and their God. And this concept of punishment for those who persecute his people, we found it, we saw it before. We saw it in Genesis 12, 3, when speaking of Israel, God said, I will curse those or the one that curses you. The one is singular, he will go to him. This principle is the same for the believers. And so as we read in verse 6, that since it is righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. And so he took comfort of the coming of Yeshua. You know, this outpouring of love from Paul on these new believers is actually found in the introduction of the words. You know, in the first letter, you know, we read that to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father, you know, here it changes. It became in the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father. The pronoun change. Because when it comes to the suffering of his people, God is present. And while God does not judge right away, this doesn't mean that there will be no judgment. He is coming, the Bible says, in flaming fire. And who are these people who are persecuting the believers? Now see what Paul says of them in verse 8. We read that Yeshua is coming back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God. Now, does God punish people who do not know him? That, that's not what it means. Right? It is not because they do not know, nor because they did not want to know God, as much as they, they, they willingly suppress the knowledge of God from their minds, which led them to do awful things. This is what the Bible says. As far as the Bible is concerned, all men know God. Romans 1 says, it says, they suppress the truth in, in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest to them, for God has showed them to them. So don't believe them when they say, I don't know God. Right? They do. They suppress that knowledge. No man can claim ignorance of God. No one can play this game with God. And they know it. I believe they know it. And the result of suppressing the knowledge of God in one's mind will lead the people to do awful things. Because Paul says in verse 21, they became futile in their speculations for their foolish heart was darkened. Remove God, and this is what happens. Remove the light and darkness will settle. Turn off the lights and see what happens. Darkness. But the Bible is clear in saying that all men know God. Now, have you noticed that uh, no one really talks so constantly about God as those who insist that there's no God. Have you noticed these things? They cannot believe that they don't believe. Right? You know, once a wise man was once confronted with an atheist, and after he allowed him to bring all the arguments he wanted to, he said, it amazes me to find an intelligent person who fights against something which he does not at all believe exists. All men know God, and to ignore him cannot make him disappear. But... It will make one's condition worse, always. And in his encouragement, Paul said something we also need to look at before we move into the prophecies. Speaking of the effect of persecution and suffering, Paul says in verse 5, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. Now, does persecution and affliction make us worthy for heaven? Let me tell you what, what really makes us worthy of the kingdom of God is Yeshua, his death and resurrection. However, there's a sense where those who endure persecution through faith and love will be counted worthier than others who don't have any of these things. Isn't it logical that those who work hard to perfect their love and, and faith through obedience and discipline and work all the time those, I believe, will be counted worthier, right? By the way, this is a call for action. For we will be all happy, by the way, in heaven. Everybody's going to be happy. But somehow, some will be better prepared and fit for this new life. And there, these will be better equipped to receive the full joy and gladness. These are those who are called worthy here. One last word of this, for this section in verse 9. As the Spirit speaks of everlasting destruction. He also gives us actually a definition of what hell is. Hell is an everlasting destruction from what? What did the verse say? First, the presence of the Lord and second, from the glory of his power. 
This is a concise definition. Hell means separation from God, and this also is logical. You know, if today many do not want to hear about God, they don't want to be in the presence of God, why should they want to be in his presence for eternity? The separation is a choice. So is hell a choice. It was built people do not, because people do not want to hear about God. God, I want to tell you, cannot force anyone who does not want to be with him now on this earth to spend eternity with him. It won't make sense, for he respects everyone's decision. And refusing the presence of God in one's life is to refuse to enjoy the glory of his power. You know, I would not know how to define these great words, the glory of his power, except to think of the great revelation of his being when, when we shall see him in his splendor, in his excellent majesty, and in his mighty power and tender love. This is perhaps what it means. That man suppress the knowledge of God from his heart and mind, and that man does not desire to be with God, does not stop God, by the way, to always be persistent and persistent in offering salvation to everyone. You know, there's one verse I often think about, which really brings out the patience and love of God and also his persistence. We've seen it long ago. I want to bring it back to you. It's Revelation 6. 16 to 17. This is at the very end, completely, just before the last men standing were, were taken away for judgment. And see what they say to the mountain when they see the Messiah coming. They say, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? Do you think, do you see something quite peculiar in this verse? Yeshua doesn't come as a warrior or as a judge. Even then, he comes and appears as a lamb, as if to tell them, you know what? Say it, say it, say it. Like, give your life to Yeshua and you'll be saved. It is as if to give yet another opportunity to those last people on earth after the tribulation. Yet, what do they do? They hide. They hide. Isaiah said it, by the way. This is what they would do, right? They would say, enter the rock from the glory of his majesty, Isaiah 2.10. By the way, it is the last time they would see him as a lamb, unfortunately. Paul concludes chapter 1 with words of encouragement. Here again, he repeats that now they are worthy, worthy to meet the Lord. You know, because why? Because he thought the Lord was coming at any time. It was imminent. Verse 11, 12, he says, therefore, we also pr pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his kingdom and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Yeshua Mashiach may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. Paul's constant prayer for these new believers was their sanctification. This is what he wanted. And he sees that it is in their growth and change of character that the name of our God may be glorified. Right? The word glorified in you carries a great responsibility for us. You know, it is when we glorify God that we can fulfill and also fully benefit from all the good pleasure of his goodness, as he says. We will not only receive blessing from the goodness, but also faith with power. These are powerful words that we see here. By the way, this is such a great deal. Obey the Lord. He'll give you power in your prayers, in your life. All of these things are a preparation to what Paul is about to teach us about the times preceding the second coming of the Messiah. For in the scriptures, the end cannot come or cannot be dissociated with your sanctification. Right? We've learned this so far. And looking at the overall chapter 1, we learned that it was not easy. It was not easy for the first churches. Right away, they were under persecution, affliction. You know, archaeologists digging in the remains of a school from the 3rd century in Rome, they found a picture that was drawn to mock a boy's faith. It shows a boy standing, his hand raised, worshipping a figure on the cross. The figure looks like a man, and they put the head of a donkey. They were making fun of Jesus, right there. And right under, one could read God. And nearby, in the second inscription, Alexamenos is faithful, right? Apparently, a young man who was a believer was being mocked by his schoolmates for his faith, you know. 
just like it is today. Increasingly so, they are making fun of our children at school when they voice their faith in Yeshua. Now let us move into the second chapter of Thessalonians. This letter of 2 Thessalonians, by the way, happens to be the middle book of the New Testament. Furthermore, we are here in the middle chapter, so we are the heart of the New Testament. And it's all about the coming of Yeshua and how to prepare for his coming. So in between the two letters, the believers in Thessalonica wrote a letter to Paul, asking for more information about the rapture and the second coming. This is how Paul begins his answer. Verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. So verse 1 deals with two things. Two things here. First, the coming of the Lord, Yeshua Mashiach. That is, the second coming. Second, our gathering to him. That is, the rapture. They wanted to know more about the revelation or the relation between the two. And this is what Paul is about to tell us in the coming chapter. Do the rapture and the second coming occur at the same time, as many believe? Or is the rapture comes before the second coming, or before the tribulation? The word coming, by the way, in verse 1, is the famous Greek word parousia, which was adopted by the English language and which came to describe the second coming of Christ. However, here in Thessalonians, Paul uses parousia for the rapture and the second coming. But what is clear is that in the text is that here he means the second coming. In classical Greek, this word was used also to describe the visit of a great ruler and even of a deity. And in both cases of the rapture and the second coming, Yeshua is our great ruler. So Paul will in this chapter show that these two comings are different and they will occur at different times. First, he begins to encourage them by telling them that what they were living was not the day of the Lord as they were taught. This is what we see in verse 2. Not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Already they were coming with, they were coming with false teachings. This represents the first part of a long argument which says that the believers will not go through the tribulation. He will soon teach that there are a few preconditions to the day of the Lord or the day of Christ to begin, but none for the rapture, which he already demonstrated for it will come at any time. So it is impossible for the believers to be in there. This is his argument. But what did the believer in Thessalonica think then in 50 AD that they were in the tribulation time? What went on? What went on? I want to tell you, everything around them seems to be pointing to the times of the tribulation. They were surrounded with all the elements that will be present at the beginning of the tribulation, and some believed it was. See the three things okay, that actually disturbed them in verse 2. The Spirit, the Word, and the letter. Spirit, not the Holy Spirit, but a foreign spirit. We're going to see that the doctrines, false doctrines, are actually the doctrines of false spirits, of demons. This spirit here may be anyone who comes with a new revelation. And these new visions were very frequent. That is, 50 years later, okay, John actually told them, test every spirit. Test every spirit. To test everyone who comes actually to them. So frequent, actually, it was that the church seems to have gotten together to put together a book called The Teaching of the Lord Through the Twelve Apostles, also called the Didache, right? which is a book contain, contains many rules concerning the itinerant prophets and to actually to know how to deal with them. Today we don't need this book. We have the scriptures, the scriptures. All the books of the scriptures have been bounded and there we'll find the teaching of God in there. Next, the word or by letter, as if from us. This speaks of the many books and information that came their way and brought much confusion. You know, at the time, there was a huge amount of literature, and the greater majority of this literature claimed divine authority. Have you ever wondered about this massive amount of, of books at that time? Have you heard of the Apocrypha? I tried to, find, to figure out how many there were. I can't. 
There are so many of them. The Apophrica, you know, these, these were written very close to the first coming of Yeshua at the time between 300 AD and 70 AD. As if to counteract, to draw on completely the message of the gospel for most of these pretend divine revelation. And they were proficient in teaching the end times. And these are among new information circulating in the churching the churches that is disturbing their faith. You know what apocrypha means? Hidden. <laughs> Hidden. Such an appropriate title for their writers pretended to have special knowledge that you cannot find in the scriptures. And there are so many of these books. Have you heard of the epistle of Jeremiah, which he never wrote? Or the epistle of Tobit and Judith, which Ezra never wrote, which they said. Or the epistle of Nicodemus, which he actually never wrote. The gospel of Mary, the gospel of Peter, the gospel of Thomas, the first apocalypse of James. See what they had to contend with? These are among the word and letters received, and these were preached, actually. These books are still, by the way, venerated by many. Furthermore, this had a lot to say about the end times, like the many false teachings circulating the internet and the many books today. The early one, ones taught that a great period of suffering will occur before the day of the Lord, and so they came to them, they say, you're suffering, this is it, right? What about the Antichrist? The Antichrist, many believe he was Nero, or an emperor, actually, who wanted to get into the temple and put his image in there. Everything actually concorded for them to believe it was the end. And you know, they were very disturbed. This is what we read in verse 2. Look again. Not to be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed. The word shaken is used to describe a troubled sea, even an earthquake. And Yeshua uses the same word in Matthew 24 when he speaks of the end time. And then he says the power of the heaven will be shaken. They were shaken in their faith. The other word to become distressed means to go to and fro. To become unsettled. But we ought not actually to be afraid of any of these things. Because if you stay in the word of God, there's nothing like this. That is what false teaching will produce. Confusion, havoc, and then destruction. You know, a story is told of a man who resisting, resisting that is the, co the cost of oats, he fed his mule, decided to actually gradually substitute sawdust, sawdust in, his, in its diet. Everything went fine for a while, and by the time the mule was satisfied with sawdust, it died. The same is true spiritually. The, the changeover from truth to error, I want to tell you, is very subtle very slow process and the people don't always know the difference but before you know it they're dead we're going to see how jesus actually speaks of some churches now let us read further for this is only the beginning of an argument that paul will clarify as we move on deeper into the text it is in verse 3 where he gives two events that will precede actually the tribulation events the believers will not experience in their fullness. We will look into one of them for now. Let us see what the verse says. It says, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless first. What comes? The apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Two things which will precede the day of the Lord. Apostasy and the men of lawlessness. Two things the believers will not see, at least in their final stage. These two things are so important that they were there at the very beginning of the birth of the church. They were always present in its history. And these are the things that will usher the tribulation times when it will reach its final observable stage. And apostasy, actually, takes a big part in the teaching of the apostle that we have in the scriptures. It is there. In fact, every epistle, except perhaps for one, warns us about the facet, a facet of the apostasy of the church. And so we need to know what it is. For instance, in 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2, as you have it in the screen, it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter days, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisies. 
having their own conscious sear with a hot iron, right? You know what it means? They don't want to hear anything anymore. It's finished. They, they, they seem to have reached the point of no return. The latter times began 2,000 years ago. This is when the apostasy began. Here, it's growing. Peter also warns the church. And he says that there were also false prophets among the people. They started then. Even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresy, even denying the Lord who brought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. See that the church was to be composed, by the way, of the wheat and the tares. And for its partner, the men of lawlessness, John tells us that its predecessors were already there in the first century. Because he tells them in 1 John 2, 18, Little children, he says, it is the last hour, and you have heard of the Antichrist. He describes him, in fact, in Revelation 11, uh, that is 13. He says, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour, right? You know, the spectrum of the apostasy and the Antichrist were there from the beginning, and this is what Paul calls in verse, actually, 7, the mystery of lawlessness. A mystery mentioned in the New Testament is one mystery in the Hebrew scriptures but revealed in the New Testament. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work, Paul says here in verse 7, meaning that evil has a strategy, a strategy to destroy everything that belongs to God. It started and it will go on increasing. And furthermore, these two partners, apostasy and the Antichrist in the tribulation time actually, they are together, they work together. At the very end, the apostasy and the men of lawlessness are the main players in the tribulation. The apostasy is symbolized by the false religion. And the men of lawlessness, of course, is the Antichrist. John was given a vision, remember, in Revelation 17, about this partnership, about apostasy and the men of lawlessness. And he says, he says, and he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness and I saw a woman that is the apostasy personified the false church in the tribulation sitting on a scarlet beast as the antichrist full of blasphemous names having seven heads and ten horns Revelation 17 is about the fall of the apostasy Revelation 18 is about the fall of the antichrist Revelation 19 Jesus comes back to establish his kingdom now let us take a closer look at the apostasy for now and follow its development you know, it's after 20 years of being in the same house that Sharon decided to have a garden in the backyard. So she, she bought some vegetable plants, you know, and some uh, other beautiful flowers. And one of them she, bought, she brought home is the oleander plant. I don't know if you know about it. You know, this plant produces some beautiful white flowers which emit a very, very pleasant scent. You know, my first reaction was to gather a few flowers and to make a tea. You know, it called me for that. But of course, we out to test all the plants, not all the spirits and the plants too. So we looked in the internet how to make a tea with oleander. Well, the first thing that comes, okay, the title is like this, Oleander, Herbal Drought of Death. <laughs> because it's a, the plant is poisonous. It is poisonous. The article actually said that a woman made tea out of it and she died. Imagine. We further read that anyone who eats or chews any of these leaves called 911 right away. Okay? How could, I want to ask you, how could such a beautiful plant with such pleasant smelling flowers, okay, kill? Right? This is the outcome of the fall. I believe it. Not every natural things are the way of God the way he created them, that is, originally. And so we renamed the plant from oleander. We called it holy ender. With an age, a big age, and ender, dash ender. Okay. Welcome to the world of apostasy, so to speak. It, you know, it was at the right time when I was, I was learning about apostasy. Now, what does apostasy mean? The word apostasy, which is actually the feminine of apostation, which is the word used for divorce or a writing of divorcement. This is when someone divorces God. This is what it is. God never divorces anybody, right? Because once you're married to God, you're always married. But these people thought they were married. Okay? Like people who, who left the faith, they say, oh, I know, I read your Bible. Oh, I decided not to, to follow the same track, especially in the ancient missionaries. 
Apostasy describes an abandoning or moving away from a position or belief formerly held. This is the same word used in the parable of the sower, speaking of those who, who hear the word but did not have a firm actually stand. See, an ordinary and believer uh, cannot be an apostate, okay? But an unbeliever who came and discovered God, tasted of the heavenly gifts, and even became partners with the Holy Spirit at the end, did not like what he liked, and so he left. A good example is, of course, Judas Iscariot. But there is the trajectory of the false church, and its history, by the way, are given by Jesus. You know where? In the seven parables of the kingdom, and in his final words to the church in Revelation 2 and 3. In his address to the seven churches, which represents the church journey in history, Yeshua represents five of them, and there's a digression that is so obvious. Here is the history of the church through the ages. To Ephesus, his complaint was, you've left the first love. You forgot me. This is when the church moves away from God. And these people were producing fruit somehow. Then to Pergamos, which means married, for it was the time when the church got married with the state and with other strange doctrines. He tells her, you hold the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of Nicolaitans. Balaam, you know, found a subtle way to introduce heresy and immorality into the church. And the Nicolaitans, towards victory of the people. These were the new false teachers. To Theatira, Yeshua complained about Jezebel, who succeeded to become the wife of a king and who introduced a new form of idolatry into Israel. The two last speak of the slow departure of the church. To Sardis, Jesus plainly said, and these are very strong coming to Jesus. He says, you are dead. You are dead. This is when the church in the dark ages began to die. How can a church be dead when it is not in the word of God. This is how it is. And to Laodicea, it's even stronger. He says to, to, to this church, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because by this time, there were no more believers in there. This is the church of the tribulation. You see the digression? There is, you know, this is another indication that the believer will not go through the tribulation because Jesus will never vomit the believer. Because that church, that last church, is devoid of believers. And so he's outside knocking at the door and he says, I'm not with you anymore. Two churches are not mentioned here. Those for whom Yeshua had nothing bad to say. Smyrna, the church of, that is the early church. And Philadelphia, the church just before Laodicea. Smyrna corresponds to the one of whom believers were persecuted and killed by the Roman Empire. Until they converted the whole world or that is the whole Roman world, into Christianity. Philadelphia corresponds to the one which brought a revival in history beginning in England, especially, in the years 1800 up to the years 1970s. It is the one that was present when Israel became a country. Today we're still in this church on its way to Laodicea until the rapture comes, no more Philadelphia. Then you'll have only Laodicea. The same journey of the apocalypse or the apostasy can be found in the parables of the kingdom. Five of the seven parables describe the same digression. The first one, the parable of the sower, he, you know, Jesus is describing the life, the history of the church, and there he divides it into four sections, four soils. Only one is good. Only one produces fruits. That is the first indication that as it was with Israel, so it will be with the church. The truth is to be found again in the minority, he says, not in the majority. Then the famous parable of the wheat and the tares. One good plant and one weed together growing in the kingdom of heaven. And they grow together until the very end. The church is gone and all is left are the tear. Is the tear. Then... Two revealing ones, the parable of the mustard tree, a very unwelcome tree at the time, which grew like a weed. And the parable of the leaven, which symbolizes false doctrines. Okay? These are the illustrations Yeshua chose to describe the growth of the church. The last one, the parable of the dragnet, symbolizing the judgment, the spewing out, just like it was 
for, or will be for Laodicea. Two parables we did not mention here, that of the costly pearl, which, is, which symbolizes actually the true church of God, and the hidden treasure, which symbolizes the true Israel. Okay, there's a veil right now. It will come out. This is the journey of the apostasy until it reaches its highest and clear and observable form in the tribulation time. While we are beginning today to see this observable apostasy in its full form, says Paul, the true believers of the church will not experience it, will be taken very soon. And what is the source of the apostasy brought in by this Antichrist? The Bible said, I want to show you again the same verse, 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. This is what it is. This is what it is. It's a very serious matter as far as the scripture is concerned. Demons are behind false teachings, false teachers and false prophets. And to accept them is the best way to destroy a congregation. Mix some sawdust with the pure word of God and it will die as Sardis died. And it will eventually be spewed out by the, by the Lord as Laodicea. But are we to worry about these things? Not if we stay within the word of God, right? And the Bible has so much to tell us about this demonic activity. How close are we from the time of the apostasy? You know, I want to tell you, I read a statistic recently, you know, about North American men. A study reported by the Barna Report said that about one in three North American men claiming to be born again, but only 28% attend the congregation on any given weekend. That's not much, right? Other forms of sanctification, including Bible reading, attending Bible studies, and even tithing, right, have declined tremendously the last 20 years. Barna also found that even men who claim to be Bible believers often hold an orthodox belief. Physically raised from the dead. Now what did they believe? Well, 27% said that he actually was a sinner. In the Hebrew scriptures, God complained and asked, where are the shepherds of Israel? Where are the shepherds of the church? Barna found that only less than half of Christian men believe that they are, up, they are absolute moral truth, right? Now everything goes. I will close with what Charles Ryrie, one of gr great Bible commentators of our time, has called the morality of apostasy. While these antichrists want to be as subtle as they can, the Bible declares to us how they really are. And we need to look at the scriptures. Uh, th what I'm going to read is based on 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2 to, five, 2 to 5. You can follow with me. There are four verses. These four verses contain 18 things. 18 things to look for about these false teachers. You can just listen or follow with me. Love of the self. God is replaced by the self, right? Self-love, which stems from pride, will be the hallmark of the last days. Love of money. This follows from the first. For if self-love is gone, right? We try to satisfy it, actually, our self-love. If the love of God is gone. Third, a spirit of pride. Pride, by the way, is the reason why Satan fell. Fourth, blasphemy. That is the last resort for those who do not know or don't want to know God. Disobedience to parents and authority. Six, lack of thankfulness. Seventh, lack of holiness. Eighth, without natural affection. This is so important. The word actually speaks of a mother's love. Perhaps this is why we have so many abortions. Nine, and ceasing enmity. So that man cannot be persuaded to enter into a covenant. Slandering. Lack of self-control. Savagery. Opposition to goodness. Traitors. Head, headiness. Love of pleasure. High-mindedness. Pretense of worship, but lack of godliness. It's incredible how they, they just list all these things. So that we know. We know that before Yeshua comes, right? Before the second coming, these things will grow. It's not a last picture of the end times, but this is what the Bible 
sets of men at the end. As for us, we need to always stay within the scriptures. We need to be always thankful, right? In chapter 1, verse 3, Paul says, we are bound to always thank the Lord. Whatever we have, we thank the Lord. Not like this little boy, who when a lady gave him a piece of pie, the little boy said, thank you. So she smiled and said, I love to see little boys say thank you like this. So he said, if you put a little more ice cream, I'll say it again, right? <laughs> So whatever God gives, it's always good for us, right? Let us be satisfied with what we have. Let us pray. Let us pray. Again, our Heavenly Father, our hearts praise you this morning. Our utmost soul exalts in your name. For the Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. Lord, we've come today to worship you. You are our God, and we love you. We stand before you in humility, recognizing your presence. Your grace sustains us. Your love motivates us. Your presence commits us to do your will. And to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God and Savior, Yeshua Mashiach, who is before all ages, now and forevermore. And to the congregation, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you all.